Okay, so good evening everyone, and thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. So today we are very grateful to have Mr. Fadi Gandur and Mrs. Samar Dudin here today to speak with us. Now as NYU students and as an NYU uh, Stern business student myself, or even anyone, I think there's so much that we can learn from these two, so I'd like to thank you all, uh, thank, thank you two for coming. Thank you. And so today we're going to be here to talk about Ruwad, which is a non-profit community development organization that works with disenfranchised communities in Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon, and Palestine. And Ruwad is anchored through three main programs, which is child development, uh, youth organization, and community support. And so through its vast array of programs and initiatives, Ruwad hopes to generate opportunity, level the playing field for the youth, nurture civic engagement, and actively encourage throughout our solutions. But they're going to be talking more about that. I'd like to introduce Mr. Gandur, who is the founder and, and vice chairman of Aramax, an international transportation and logistics services company based in Dubai. He is currently the executive chairman of Wamda Capital, a new venture capital fund focusing on tech investments in the MENA region, which is the Middle East and North Africa region. Not only that, he is the co-founder of MENA Venture Investments, a seed capital investment company uh, focusing on early stage companies in the MENA region and beyond. Now, his belief in corporate social responsibility led him to have Aramax be the first company in the region to release a sustainability report. As the founder and chairman of Rwanda for Development today, Mr. Gandur looks to stimulate the community through the private sector of the Middle East. He looks to the Arab private sector for sustainable development of the region, as well as to play an active role in nurturing healthy and entrepreneurial ecosystems. Now, Mrs. Duden is one of the pioneers of drama and theater in education in Jordan. She places a special emphasis on the creative, social, and emotional development of children and youth. And she is an active member that has participated in, in and launched many initiatives. She is a member of the advisory committee of the Arab Education Forum, a founding member of the Creative Network Initiative, a founding board member of the Al Balad Theater, a member of the Jordanian Children's National Museum, and even served as a member of the Amman City Council, just to name a few. So today she is the regional director and head of programs for Wad. She leads and designs youth educational programs and organizes community-led campaigns which focus on social change through grassroots leadership development. Some of her programs include the Six Minutes campaign and the Safe Homes campaign. And so now they're here to talk more about what they do at Wad and the impact they are making in the Middle East. So without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Mr. Gandura and Mrs. Dean. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Before, uh, it's an honor to be, to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Before we start, I'd like to, if you, if you don't mind going quickly across the room, just to get uh, your name and uh, what you're studying, if you don't mind. So we'll start with you, Alex. Okay, so I'm Alex. I'm a sophomore student, and I'm at NYU Stern. Okay, business. Yes. Uh, I'm Natalie, I'm a freshman, and I'm studying global liberal studies. Okay. I'm Nicole, I'm a sophomore, and I'm studying politics. Okay. I'm Sulaiman, I'm a sophomore, I'm studying politics. What's your name? Sulaiman. Okay. Sulaiman. Yes. Mm -hmm. ah, okay. I'm studying philosophy and ISG. Yeah. Cool. I'm Samsha, I'm a freshman, and I think I'll be studying linguistics. Mm -hmm. I like the I think part. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm Melissa, I'm a sophomore and I'm studying politics as well. I'm Adriano from the University of Florence with a previous background in international relations. Okay. I'm a donor to New York University and a friend of Ellen's, and um, I'm retired from the entertainment business, oh. <laughs> and I come to Florence four times a year. And what's your four name? Four months a year. What's Martha Latrell. Okay. Yeah. Pleasure. Hi, Hello. I'm Helen. Um, I, I'm a freshman and I'm studying politics and history. Uh, hi, I'm Michelle. Uh, I'm a freshman and I will be studying drama and politics. Okay. Uh, my name is Eilish. I'm a freshman and I'll be studying global studies. Okay, and the, and the rest, do you mind? Yeah. No, no. I'm David uh, Lombardo. I, I teach. Ah, oh, okay. Cool. I teach history. Uh, my name is Carol, and I'm a film director from California, back here living 15 years. Mm -hmm. I'm Ian, I'm coordinating a lot of dialogues. Thank you for inviting us. And? Mahnas Yusuf Sadeh, visiting professor from NYU. Your first name is? Mahnas. Mahnas. 
I am also involved with Seeds of Peace, ah. which is a... Mm. Mm. I know Seeds of Peace very well. Yes, and I'm on the board in London. Ah, very cool. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah, yes. Parker, introduce yourself. Oh, yes. Hi, my name is Parker. Um, I'm going to study artificial intelligence. Ooh. Oh. Uh, so <laughs> 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 You're making all our jobs obsolete. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, thank you for, for giving us the time on, on Thursday afternoon. Uh, uh, summer. My partner and I, and Amanda is my sister, who works also with us, we are uh, going to take you through a journey of what we're doing with the web. But I also heard that you've been going and discussing uh, in the past <coughs> few weeks uh, the Middle East. So there are many stories in the Middle East, and I wish uh, that we could tell you alternative stories to the stories you've been hearing, because I'm pretty sure you were only listening to stories about Syria, uh, Iraq, Libya, and Yemen. And there are, and there are 22 countries in the region. Uh, most of them don't have wars and don't have civil wars and are doing incredible things. So don't think that the Arab world is about these four countries only. And don't think that the news that you read is the only news that is uh, uh, generating uh, in the region and for the region. So we'll tell you a story about uh, how we want to be activists in the region and address the challenges of Youth. youth, as you might have heard before, in the region, uh, the young population under the age of 25 is probably uh, somewhere between uh, 55 and 60 percent of the population. So quite an amazing uh, amount of energy, quite an amazing opportunity, uh, opposite to what people might think that this is a challenge, but when there's a challenge, there's also a massive opportunity. And what do you do with people with your age, people that have aspirations and want to do things, and how do you make sure that they are still or given the opportunity to focus on what, uh, focus on building rather than focus on something else. And that's at the core of the story that we are going to tell you about the work today. So we're titling it, it takes a community because it does. It takes a community, it takes a village, it takes a a neighborhood, it takes all sorts of different elements of society to come together and address the challenges of marginalization. So Ruwad is a story, Ruwad, by the way, in, in English, uh, in, uh, Ruwad is an Arabic word for entrepreneurs. Uh, entrepreneurs, why did we call it entrepreneurs? Because uh, it has another word to it, so it's entrepreneurs for development. It is how do you bring the entrepreneurial mind, the entrepreneurial thinking, into the development process. And it is at the core uh, of it that development, uh, societal development, if you want to call it that, should not be uh, the domain of a single uh, uh, entity in society. It's not, it should not be only the role of government that is responsible for development. Everyone should be part of that process. And the entrepreneurial community is an absent community that has not been part of the development process specifically in the Middle East. And so we call it through well because it means two things. It means entrepreneurs are coming to be particip to participate in the development process, working with marginalized communities. So it's people that have not been in the process of development, so marginalized for by themselves because they haven't participated in it, going to people that are on the margins who don't mean to be on the margins, but society has forgotten them. And thus, when these two people meet, then all sorts of things happen. And this is the story of Ruwad. So Ruwad started, as you have heard earlier from Alex, and we're in four countries, but we started in, in this little uh, community in, 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 uh, in, in the heart of the city of Amman, the capital of Jordan. It's about 50 to 100,000 people. We don't know exactly the number, but let's say, for the sake of, of today's talk, this, this 50,000 people. And we effectively uh, went there 10 years ago. This is our 10th anniversary, and, and uh, we went there as part of my uh, company that I had started, Aramex, which is uh, a logistics company that for them. Uh, for the lack of a better description, it's a FedEx of the Middle East. 
So we said, how do we actually work with youth? How do we participate in the development process? How do we take our corporate social responsibility work a step further than just simply doing uh, or contributing money or, or working with other NGOs and be uh, activists ourselves on the ground and do these projects ourselves inside the organization and bringing all the capabilities of the organization and the people in it to that process of working with these young marginalized people. That's the original idea. So we didn't have really any clear concept of what we wanted to do. But we knew that we wanted to work with youth. That's long before the Arab Spring. We knew that there was something that needed to be done and we need to engage these people that are on the margins. So we went to a small NGO in the community called the Jabal al-Nadif. Again, this is Jabal al-Nadif. It means the, mount, the clean mountain. Jabal in Arabic means mountain, and Nadif means clean. So it's the clean mountain, just so that you get a reference point on it. So we went to uh, the community center that's called the Jabal al-Nadif uh, uh, Community uh, Associate. Association. And this gentleman here, this is a very recent picture of him. But 10 years ago, he stood up. We brought all the... So we were strangers to the community. So I come in with a couple of my colleagues, and we say, you know, we're from Aramex. I am so-and-so. They, nobody had heard of me, obviously. And these people were hospitable. You come to the community, you say, welcome. But what the heck are you doing here, and what do you want from us, effectively? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're like very skeptical and very suspicious. So this guy stands up, and we had about 10 of the young and mostly elders of the community. So Abu, uh, Abu, Abu Kamil, his name is, Abu Kamil stands up and so it gives us a lecture. So he had prepared a speech, he's probably 85 now, prepares a speech and lectures us about the importance of doing things and then we get so many promises over the years and nobody delivers. And what the, you're coming to promise stuff, I'm pretty sure you're not going to be delivering. Because we've seen people like you before. We've seen government officials, we've seen politicians, we've seen members of parliament come only when the elections are happening and then they disappear, just like the United <laughs> States. So, no, I'm kidding. So, um, or maybe not. So, <laughs> and then he pulls out a letter that he got from a prime minister in Jordan in 1967, long before most of us were born. And he says, you see this letter? And he reads it. And it's a letter of approval by the Prime Minister saying, we, we got your letter of request that you want a police station in your community and we approve that we are going to establish a police station in your community. And he says, you see this letter? Since 1967, we still don't have a police station here. Alright, that's that if you want to think about marginalization, this is marginalization. It is a community that has been forgotten. And they have had a history of either being promised or being forgotten and nothing happens. So they proceed to list all sorts of things that they need. And let me show you a short film about what they asked us what they wanted from. This is a very short film. This, this was done a year after we entered the community. A year. In the video, I'm not sure. 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 I'm not sure
we have no post office, we have our schools are run down. There's about, around that community, there's about six or seven schools, and in the extended community, about 13 schools. Uh, the schools are run down, we don't have a health clinic, we don't have a community center, the bus doesn't stop here anymore, it used to stop here, and then uh, there is no, uh, it says no access to higher education, it means we don't have money to send our kids to universities, and then there's high youth unemployment. There's not only high youth unemployment, there's 35% general unemployment in the community. It's not only about the youth, it is about everyone. It's completely at the margins and they don't have any serious sources of income. So this is as marginal as possible. Please, yes, come in. And uh, even, even people around the community, around the, the other parts of the city, if uh, you tell them I want to go to Jabal al Nadif, they either not know where it is or they'll be scared to death. To say Jabal al Nadif, you know, this is a scary area. Why would anybody want to go there? Just like any, any possible uh, discommunication between different parts of, of the community. So we basically did a very simple process, like all entrepreneurs, and eventually some of you are going to be entrepreneurs, like Alex maybe, and maybe, uh, maybe others here. Like all entrepreneurs, the first thing that you do when you hear a challenge is do what? Is I say, yes, I can do it. This is the first thing that you do. I mean, entrepreneurs are, are risk takers and they're overconfident sometimes and say, yes, everything that you told us here, we're going to do for you. And literally, and, and that's why, because entrepreneurs have capital, have networks, have solutions, thinking, employment. This is a can-do mentality. These are people that don't think like governments. These are projects that we need to take or maybe uh, the community is too small. Let's go focus on something that is bigger, that makes a bigger splash. Why should we come here? And you know, nobody's listening to them. Anyway, so why should we come here? But somebody uh, like me, maybe, like, uh, who's an entrepreneur or, or, or my, from my company, who has an entrepreneurial culture, and it says, well, you know, these are challenges and we have everything that is possible that we can have, and these are the issues that they came up with are easily solvable. Easily solvable. Fixing, fixing a school is easily solvable. Um, a bus station is easily solvable. Setting up a clinic is easily solvable. I mean, it's not, it takes a little bit of capital, but if you, have, if you think solutions rather than think challenges, then you automatically see opportunities all over the place. So the first test for us was this school. This is a school that has about eight rooms in it, and it hosts 700 students. 350 in the morning and 350 in the afternoon in two shifts. In two shifts and two sets of classes. First, uh, first grade, uh, KG1 to KG3, and then in the afternoon, KG3 to KG6. In the morning, they're mixed. In the afternoon, girls are alone and boys are alone because they, they split them. Uh, after eight years. After eight years, they split them. So, this is the school. All right, this is how it looked like. And then we see, and this is a government owned school. All right, this is the, most of the schooling in the, in the Arab world. Most of the public as this public school. There are private schooling, but the core of the uh, of the youth that graduate from our schools are graduate from public schools. So here's the school. They said you need that school to be fixed. So that was our first test. So we went to the government. We got the permission, and we said we want to fix a school that is owned by government, which was weird. It, so why do you want to spend private money on public schools for a school that's completely on the margins? We said because if the government is forgetting this and we are able to fix it, then why don't we fix it? So it was very simple. It took us about six months and the school was fixed, literally. So we adopted that school. Until today, that school is within our domain. We always look after it and look at, uh, after everything that happens in it. And it was at the core and the seed of where we actually launched our program of demarginalization of ourselves as entrepreneurs who were living in affluence and forgetting that there are our neighbors who are only 15 minutes away from the most affluent uh, part of the city. Uh, uh, this is where we came to actually uh, bring ourselves into activism and address the challenge. We fixed the school. And that school had not been fixed by anyone else before anyone else before. What does that do to people? We, it gives them confidence that there are people that will promise and deliver. We didn't only fix the school. We built the clinic. We 
lobby government, and we have a police station. It took us two years. We brought the police station because we were connected. We took the community with us. Together, we went to government and lobbied enough to get the police station. We have, we, we built the post office for them. We built, the, this is the books, the, uh, the small uh, library. library, and the community center. This is at the core of it. Within a month, within a year and a half, everything that they asked for, everything, not a single thing that they asked for did not happen. And what, the, what happens when, when you promise and deliver? You basically have the ultimate trust. From extreme skepticism to being fought in mosques, we were fought in mosques. Who, who are these people? Why are they coming to our community? Why do they have boys and girls meeting in one room? There's all sorts of... Uh, who are these strangers that are coming from the affluent side of the city? Who, what do they want from us? Are they running for elections? Is this legitimate money? Uh, you know, and legitimately asking questions. It's a legitimate proposition. But the minute we delivered in everything that they asked for, and they found that we really, at the end of the day, in, in a very slow and meticulous process, discovered that we really are in the business of exactly what we say we are doing. That we are activists, we are coming here because we want to come here, because we feel that we are part of that community and we are reconnecting. There is that two-way street of us working together to find a way to address the challenges of our regions and our communities and our cities and our countries. And by delivering all these things, there was ultimate trust and there was suddenly, suddenly, literally, within, within the, 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 the second, a part of the second year, there was this symbiotic relationship that slowly started evolving into doing all sorts of things together that were magical in many ways. And they were transformative and, 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 and got us to do a lot of the stuff that you're going to hear someone say. Yes, please. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but this is just, uh, it's just a, um, the full picture of prominently figure women. And so, because this is the picture of we gain the trust, I cannot but make that as well. This is, that this is a woman. Gaining, gaining the trust is gaining the... Uh, somehow the support of the women so side somehow, of the community. Yeah. Uh, just, you you just find that the, strange? Or no, no, no. I find that the, the, I find that the, 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 the Yes, more or less. So I can put that on the tell you why. Someone, because someone lives in the community. I am I am much okay. more a visitor. But okay. someone will tell you. Uh, the communities on the margins are run by women, not by men. Because the men wake up very early in the morning. They go to work or they have, you know, men do other things. And they might not have slept there at night anyway. And, uh, and vanish. There are plenty of single moms. Yeah. Plenty of single moms. So the community is a community of women. If you come in the morning between, let's say, 8 in the, in the morning and 5 in the afternoon, the men are not there. It's the women that are there. So, and someone will explain and talk about that. But yes, we have plenty of women. And... Someone will explain the core of the program. So everything that we did is not stuff that we do. We don't fix schools. We don't build clinics. We don't build community centers. That's not what we actually do. We went into the community. We went into the community to work with youth. And what did the youth want? They wanted scholarships. And we came up with a very, very powerful program, I think. And this is at, at the core of how we change education. We change mindset and we build character and we build a generation for the future that revolves around the simple concept that says we will provide you a scholarship to go to university in return you're going to give us four hours of volunteer work every single week in the community or anywhere else where we put a program it's very simple give and take you give me your time I'll give you a scholarship so there is no charity here it is not about one being more powerful than the other and say, because I have money, I am able to do things. I'm saying, I will give you, the, I will pay you for your university. I don't want you to be the top student in the university. I'm not giving you a scholarship because you're a genius, Alex. I'm giving you a scholarship because you are on the margins and you want to work hard and you want to eventually graduate and earn a living. All right? In return, I'm going to get you to work. I need you to give me time. But that time, 
that time you're giving me is not for me. It's for you in your community. So you volunteer in addressing the challenges in your community. So you, it is an empowerment process that tells people on the margins who have been marginalized, who feel that they are helpless and they are waiting forever for government to come and solve their problems. What do you give them? You give them the power of saying, what the, who the heck cares if government is here or not here? Because I have the power, then I'm going to go in, in groups and address the challenges in the community. Clean the street, fix a home, teach a student that doesn't want to, that has a learning disability. Whatever program that you want to do, channel that power of, of energy of youth, knowledge of youth, in solving their own problems. And what more powerful process in feeling your, in, in changing your character when you feel that you actually own your own future and you own your own street. So you own your street. Doesn't mean you want to, uh, the government needs to abdicate that role of doing stuff, but in, the, in their absence, we're basically saying, if they don't come here or they're late in coming or, or, or the issues are not being addressed properly, then it doesn't mean we just sit and wait. And that's an alternative way of learning uh, and it's an alternative way of, of education, it's an alternative way of, of taking people outside from a mental thinking of waiting to a mental thinking of initiative, of, of activism, of, of taking ownership of their own future and becoming citizens. So we ended up, and I give this to some of now, we ended up effectively building a whole platform around that, that powerful volunteering program. Platform that gets the youth to work in child development, and someone will explain how that happens, and youth organizing their own organizing process, and then community support. Those are the core of our programs. What happens when you do a, when you build a platform? What happens? You effectively build uh, a capability and an asset uh, that is leverageable by everybody and anybody that wants to give and take from that platform. So, uh, a lady who happens to be my wife decides that she wants to work with the handicapped through art. Because the handicapped, well, you call them physically, I mean, I don't know what the political uh, correct word for them, handicapped, physically challenged, whatever. These are people that in the community, they're at home. They're a bit embarrassed about them. They don't engage. They're not, uh, and we have, uh, we have a powerful film to show about it, if, if we can eventually do that. So what did she come and do? Because she's an artist, she built a, center, a small uh, workshop that gets these people that have been forgotten, and you should see the work that they do. They produce brilliant pieces of art that get sold to the affluent. And you recycle the money into, back to them, so they make money, they earn a living, and they feel, they feel they are suddenly active in the community. They are, they are no longer completely marginalized in the marginalization process of the community. And then everything else that you see. So private sector, they want to send their own volunteers, and businesses want to send their own volunteers to come work with us. The schools, 13 schools send us all sorts of students to come and work with us. Government even comes down to us and says, how can we work together and municipality? And we have a legal aid station where lawyers come and give eight hours of free legal advice to the community that doesn't know its own rights. And they address about 200 cases every single month. And they, they even go to court in, 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 a, non, uh, in a pro bono basis to, to protect the community from some of the issues that they have. So this is at the core of we are. And then the community effectively embraced us. And Samar will tell us the details of the program. I took more than I needed, but Samar, you can... us because the most valuable asset you have at any point in time is relationships. Because we made time to be present in the community, to listen, to empathize, to negotiate, to confront, and to differ at points in time. And over time, that relationship was built. So I would say that one of the most important elements in the way we actually built the programmatic component was that we were invested 
in building the relationship with the community. Because relationships, in essence, are about an exchange of benefits, but also values, livelihood, presence. And because we were present physically, Sadi bought two buildings, so we were present, <laughs> uh, we actually had that uh, luxury on one level, and also we had the challenge on the other level to invest in those relationships. I personally came into Rouad uh, as a volunteer. I volunteered from 2006 to 2009. I uh, created a small component in the youth program called Dardashat, Dialogic Forums. The youth with whom we used to work, who used to give us community service hours in exchange for the scholarships, used to come every Saturday for a two-hour open discussion these are types of activities that take no place in the community of Jabal al nadif And let me just recontextualize it. This is a community in East Amman that borderlines an informal <coughs> Palestinian refugee camp. So in all the big cities of the Arab world, there are marginalized communities, slum areas. In Jordan specifically, that is the symptom of marginalization in a big city like Amman. 54,000 people live in Muhammad Amin camp. Youth go to schools that teach them didactic content. They are trapped between a very didactic school, a patriarchal system at home, and through all types of religious operators of charity, and a neighborhood where there are drugs and abuse and violence. So we are not talking about an abstraction. I'm sure you all live in cities, and you know what slum areas feel like and look like. So what did we do? We want to build power. And power is relational. And it is when people mobilize their resources to create the change they want to see. So perhaps some of you would say, on the level of governance and the foundation level, we are private sector led because our operation is unlike other NGOs in the region that depends on aid and external donors. Our operation depends on entrepreneurs investing money in the reward model. Okay? On that level, yes, we take private sector money, but on the level of the operation, what we do is we do a lot of participatory work. We <coughs> the youth to work, and they are our partners. How does that operate? At the heart of our programs, wherever we are, whether we are in Jabal al or in other parts of Jordan or the Arab world, we create a scholarship fund in exchange for community service hours. And yes, as Fadi just explained, in one city alone, in Jabal al nadif my job is to design and craft initiatives and programs to cover the four community service hours of 150 youth which equals 600 hours a week, which equals almost 31,000 hours a year. So we create work with them for their community and for themselves by putting their hours into practice in a child, youth, community, and community campaigns and initiatives. We'll explain a little bit more, and I got you some uh, brochures so you can read more details about it. So the fun part of it is Everything we do is through the energy of young people like yourself, except they don't have the luxury of being part of NY or any other kind of university. These young people, if we don't give them the scholarships, they cannot go to university or to college. They can't. And they will be living a very disrupted type of life from informal economical activities without full engagement in the fullness of who they need to be and become as citizens of their own country. So this is the way our model works. We believe that we organize two constituencies, youth and women, through community-led campaigns. Why? Because we own four hours of the time of the youth, and we also have access to a lot of time with the women. The men usually either work or they disappear and they leave their families. And so we recognize that time is the most valuable resource we have and we have to put it to good use. 
In every single programmatic component we have of the three programs, this is the way the prototype looks like. So in the youth program, we have the service, which is the scholarship fund. We build programmatic modules because we have a cultural, business, and leadership module. All the youth who come to Rwanda have to go through all three in order to complete their journey. And we engage them in community-led campaigns. So they were engaged with us in one campaign called the Safe Home Campaign with the Mothers, where we made 165 homes safe from physical abuse against children in partnership with the mothers. So we work with the parents. We don't only work with the young people. And they are also involved in initiatives. So I get, you know, around, I would say, easily 60 to 70 young people <coughs> like you coming in to volunteer as external volunteers. We design with them certain activities they do, and they launch different initiatives with our youth, with the children, etc. Every single program we have has that same structure. So if the scholarship fund was the service of the youth program, the child library is the service of the child program. And around that service, we have a creative arts workshop, we have a, a child literature workshop, we have sports, we have science, we do all kinds of things with children. And in the community program, it's the same. Except with the community program, we really focus a lot on partnerships because we recognize that the community program has to cater for the most marginalized of the marginalized. So focusing on children and youth with disabilities, focusing on women to create income generation activities, and focusing on all kinds of rights-based services to educate more around the rights of the people. And this, these are the three programs we operate, and in all of them, the youth have to work. So what are the methodologies we use? For the youth to give community service hours, the first semester, we just tell them what do you want to do, what do you like to work with. And we try to match them with their own passion. So this way they get really motivated. But in the process of working with children, they need to learn about inquiry-based learning. This is something they never learned in school because they went to didactic schools. They learn about different schools of learning. They learn how children learn through questioning. We put them to different workshops. So when they work with the children, they are equipped. And I see them, I think, learning to be citizens because they learn how to treat small children with love and care and also with mindfulness. We put them through psychosocial support programs. We do a lot of life coaching. We do a lot of support groups. They learn to listen. They learn to empathize. They learn to explore their own emotions. They understand that suspending judgment is something very important for mindfulness. And you are talking about young people who come from a community where <coughs> the sacred is law, and where reason and doubt is something that we look at conspicuously, right? So, so it's very important that they are involved in all of that. And of course, we focus a lot on creative arts because we believe that the arts are all about open-mindedness. So the young people who are part of the journey of the world go through this process. And for me, and for Fatih, and for Amal, who by the way is our strategy advisor and a dear friend, this process is really about creating citizens. It's about saying, this is our space, it's our safe space, we own it, we will design things together. It's a free space, but it's also a very disciplined space. They apply for the scholarship process, and now we have a system. In the early years, we used to say, who are the young people on the block who would like to volunteer? Those who were consistent in volunteering, we would give them the seed scholarships. But now, after 10 years, we have a system. So when they apply, of course, we're very choosy because the one criteria we have is that they have to have evidence that they are socially and economically in need. Yeah? But we're not about the wizards. We're about the average. And so a C average kid can step in and benefit. Mm -hmm. Of course, for those who want to apply for vocational, we say, you know, you have to have a specific GPA because vocational is different from university. In my country, vocational is two years, university is four. University needs more uh, theorizing, we call it. You know? It needs more theoretical, less applied. 
uh, type of education. When they get accepted, they become members of the scholarship fund. The first fund we created in Jordan was named after a young entrepreneur, I guess, Musab Khurma. He was a friend of Fadi's, and he died during the terrorist attacks in Oman. And that was in 2005, and we named the fund by his name. But wherever we go, we name the fund differently. So the Tripoli Fund in Lebanon is named after Lebanon. The Egypt Fund in the third biggest slum area in Cairo is named after Asbet Khairallah Fund. You know, wherever we go, we name the fund differently. They become a membership group, and then they begin their journey of learning through service, through volunteerism, through putting their initiative to practice. And in that process, we work on developing thinking skills and we work on developing communication skills. And when I say that, I say that by saying we, we do enrichment programs because the youth have a lot. But they've been indoctrinating in a specific manner, so we engage them in tough things. And we have confrontations with them because to sit in a COVID environment like this is something that from the cultural viewpoint is unacceptable. To talk about ways of knowing something from the cultural viewpoint is unacceptable. There is a sense of pride in the religious identity and there's a sense of pride also in the, uh, I think, in the context itself, you know, like this is our mountain, this is our space, etc. And so we need to, to really expand that and embrace it. And sometimes we get beaten right, left and center because we have to accept that this is the community, this is how it expresses itself, this is how it expresses its anxiety, but we are present. And so many good people are there in comparison to those who actually give us a hard time, and even those who give us a hard time are people who are victims of the system, of failed policies and development, of a failure of humanity. After that process, the youth launch their own initiatives in the community. So we have a special type of uh, activity where the youth end up also designing their own initiatives. They graduate, and after they graduate, they access work easily, in my opinion. I mean, we're still studying this in our impact assessment, because as part and parcel of the programs, we have a business skills development program in partnership with RMX, with Cairo Amman Bank, with business entrepreneurs, with, uh, with academicians, with doctors, with professionals, and we create the network and the mentorship between the youth and this body of people, right? So we expand the relationships of the young people. And last uh, November, we had our graduation, and one of them has it in the film, Google our films. Most of them are subtitled. He said, I graduated, uh, you know, on Saturday, on Sunday, I applied for this job in this uh, company because I took a workshop with Aramix on I don't know what, and I knew the person, and I was able to connect, and I applied, and they saw that I did all this activity and all this community service, and I had a job. So we have, so we understand that young people need lots of good relationships, lots of connections to be able to navigate and to uh, benefit. After they graduate, they are members of Ruad Alumni, and it was a very touching moment for me and Fadi last graduation because the head of the alumni stood up and said, in the name of all the alumni of Ruad, we would like to offer one single scholarship a year, and we will fundraise it from us. And we know that all of these young people have to really take care of their own families. The young men who come to us work all the time. The women who come to us also have to work. It's a very tough environment. Of course, for us, after that, we see that we have concluded a journey where they are able to participate as active citizens, hopefully free from need, and also initiators to different types of activities in their own community. So, we're not only in Jordan. Our story is very much a Amman story. We started in Amman, the capital of Jordan, in Jabal Nuri. But we expanded to the south, to Tafila, which is a very different area. And we went to Tafila at a time where there was a lot of political and social turmoil because there's a high unemployment statistic there in Tafila. And we set up Ruwab, and it's in one of the successful uh, community centers we have. We're also in Beida, which is a small little Bedouin village. Next to Petra. Next so to most, Petra. Of you must have heard of Petra. So yeah. it's right set up in one of the most beautiful spots 
in the kingdom. It's just beautiful. And we work with the young people there. And one of them, who graduated two years ago, Aisha, is today the first teacher in the primary school of the village in the history of this school. So, in our first community, teacher from the community from to the teach community. in the community. Normally, they send them yeah. teachers from outside because they have no teachers. Yeah. In our community center in Amman, the child program officer is a graduate of Ruwad. The youth program officer is a graduate of Ruwad. The manager for community affairs is a graduate of Ruwad. So we believe in this grassroots up, and we work with the young people, and then we bring them back to work with us. In Palestine, we are in Budras and five neighboring villages, and Budras <coughs> is one of nine villages that is broken down by the Israeli world. You know that we call it the apartheid world because it took away the land of these villages. And on the other side, there's a huge settlement called Mudiain. It's one of the biggest settlements, and so these villages are in zone two. They are squeezed, very poor services. And young people were unable to go to university. Fadi had invested. Do you want to tell them the story of Budros? So in Budros, there's a famous uh, documentary on Budros. You should check it out, uh, by the way, done by, by uh, an American group called... Uh, I'll get to the name of the group. So anyway, I had I had them do the film on Budros because the activists in Budros basically uh, were the first uh, non-violent, uh, organized, uh, community, local community that brought in Israelis uh, that are uh, also part of that rejectionist movement of saying uh, you cannot have the, the new wall that was being built to come across the city. So they, they did a non-violent uh, movement for a whole year and Israel actually effectively moved the wall outside of their own land. So And they did there's a beautiful documentary about non-violent uh, resistance uh, in, in Fort Budros. And so, because I helped the group, I financed the last part of the, that documentary, uh, I was giving a talk on Ruwad uh, in a TEDx uh, uh, event in Ramallah. And the woman that worked in Budros came to me and said, you know, why we want you to come and visit us? So, I mean, you know, small world. I said, Budros, I, I was part of the original film. <laughs> so I went to Budros and spent a day. Very interesting that you should know. I basically met with the guy that led the whole process. And uh, I asked him to bring in a, a series of students there that were just studying. They were 12th grade students who were going through a public exam. If they pass, they actually qualify to go to universities. There's a public exam in our system. So you have to actually pass that public exam before you, you go to, uh, to universities. And none of the students wanted to either take the exam or they all said, why take the exam? Because we either are going to fail or we can't go to universities because we don't have money for the universities. And number two, we are so far away from any university, there's no transportation. So even if we pass, we don't go. So why should we pass? So I basically said, uh, anybody that passes, I'm guaranteeing their scholarship. And that's how the program started. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and two months later, we had six students pass. And that was the seed. Now we have how, how many? 60, 70 scholarships? 70. So, yeah. so I mean, it, this is just an example of, um, of how easy, effectively, it is to take people from, uh, from a sense of despair to a sense of, of opportunity. What does it take to tell people, um, you know, you're going to get... I mean, you know, these scholarships, again, this is not NYU uh, cost, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. So these are the average university semester. For, uh, the average student gets about $3,000 in scholarships a year. Mm -hmm. $3,000, yeah. So it's, it's for... This is the cost. You have to remember, education is for free in our region. That's... It's for free, but it's not really for free. It will cost $3,000, and $3,000 is a massive amount of money for a country that has an average uh, income per person at $5,000 a year. Yeah. Yeah. So $3,000 is, is $3,000 out of $5,000. So it makes a big difference. So this is good news. We also have the biggest slum area in Egypt, the This is like half a million people, 60% illiteracy. Almost absent infrastructure. And this is in the heart of Cairo. Yeah. So you see all the glitter of Cairo, and then suddenly you see all these 
all these slums that are one minute away from the best hotel. <coughs> So again, Fadi connected with an entrepreneur who was working there pre the revolution. Post the revolution, we had we had conducted an asset mapping exercise and a research, which Amal was heavily involved in. This entrepreneur said, I don't want to be involved in a youth empowerment organization post-revolution. Amal and I flew in, we met the 17, 18 young people who did the asset mapping. We called Fadi and we made the decision that we're going to set up a reward with the young people. And today, we have a community center that is completely youth-led, that operates with the youth of the neighborhood. And so it's not impossible. These are areas where there is no police, there is no safety. There's no streets. There's not, there are no streets. I mean, top margins, I mean, margins are different. So the marginalized in, in Calcutta, uh, look, diff- the, look at the marginalized in our Jabal and and say, oh boy, you're living in a very rich community. <laughs> so you have to remember margins and people on the margins from, from the poorest of the poor, uh, you, you have different definitions by country. So in Egypt, in, in Azbit Khairallah, there literally are no paved streets where our community center is. And you see here, marginalization is about the Ashwariyat because Cairo is built on 42% of slum areas. These are areas where people just come out of poverty and build and live in dire poverty and they tell us a lot, the young people, about also the way they are perceived from the outer world. I don't know, I mean, if you know. No, just, just one very interesting statistics. 80% of Cairoine residents live in slums. 80% of, of Cairo's population. And 50 of 12 million people. Yeah. 20. 10 million. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. 20 million. And 50% live in informal settlements like as the Khairo, that are literally invisible to the to the government. So maybe Amal, you want to touch upon Lebanon because Lebanon is quite a story, specifically with the sectarian, you know, uh, right. tensions. Well, uh, and Fadi had been um, calling me uh, incessantly. Um, <laughs> over the course of two years to look for partners in Lebanon to launch uh, Ruad and I kept telling him that we should focus on other areas because Lebanon, you know, Lebanon is, um, is a country that is pervasively sectarian, politically charged, it's a very difficult environment, we should focus on less challenging areas perhaps. So in the final analysis, I meet with a female uh, entrepreneur who actually Fadi knew well, but that was my first meeting with her. Her name is Hala Fadl, and uh, she's one of the more successful uh, business entrepreneurs uh, in, uh, in Lebanon. And immediately after lunch, I called Fadi and I said, I think we have, uh, we have a partner. So Hala uh, is not from Tripoli, she's from the north, uh, but her husband is from Tripoli. And this had nothing to do with her husband. Her husband is actually a politician, so she wanted to do this entirely on her own. That was a bit sensitive for us because we do not want to be politicized in any way, shape, or form. So uh, we went ahead with her. We created a reward uh, on the demarcation line between two communities, warring communities in Tripoli. Jabal Mahsin, which is composed of Alawites, and perhaps you've heard about Alawites. They are very much... Uh, the sect of Bashar al-Assad in Syria. And these are people who actually left Syria decades ago and settled in uh, Jabal Mahsin. Uh, and then we have on the other side Bad Tibbani, which is uh, composed basically of Sunni uh, uh, residents. And of course, these two communities are pretty much controlled by the various politicians. So, depending on the politics of the day or of the week, they might go to war, and you're going to have tens or hundreds of casualties, depending on what's at stake. It's an, a very marginalized area, destitute. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is that Tripoli actually is home to some of the richest people in Lebanon. The extraordinary thing is that Tripoli, over the course of 56 years, started to lose basically um, the fundamentals of a decent life. Um, so we set it up, and we set it, we set up the, the community center right on the demarcation line. We take 50% of our scholars from 
Jabal Mahsen, the outright community, and 50% from the Sunni community, and literally, in no time, um, the community center became practically the only place where the two warring communities would come together. Mm-hmm. So, to go back to what, how Fadi described it as a platform, um, because of the unique um, uh, character of Tripoli, we ended up adding a conflict resolution component to the platform, which actually we don't have in places like Egypt and, and Amman, because there's not that kind of political environment and circumstance. Uh, and it quickly grew to be a main uh, community center. I mean, Mahala is, is a very aggressive uh, entrepreneur. We have three ladies working with us, very sharp, very active. Uh, they took to it uh, very quickly. And uh, you know, perhaps Summer can, can talk about this uh, a bit. It's, it's interesting when you deal with the community like Jamal and Nadif and Jordan, because it's very much the desert of the desert. But Samar was actually shocked when she came to Lebanon because Tripoli is actually a very conservative city. Uh, and when I say conservative, I mean conservative, very conservative. It's actually a city that's become uh, host to some of the most nefarious groups that you read about practically every single day. ISIS, Al-Qaeda, <laughs> and Nusra, some very scary people. But Samar was really very surprised to see that the, because of the Mediterranean, there is an extraordinary energy and vivaciousness on the part of the kids, the girls and the boys, and an immediate uh, willingness to open up and uh, just you know embrace life. Yeah. So and we're there. An, an entrepreneurial spirit. Oh, because, very because entrepreneurial. Sarah, because Sarah Sarah Lebanese. Lebanese. <laughs> the, she was able in one year to set up a kitchen, a productive kitchen, where the women from the Alawis and the Sunnis who lost their children during the sectarian war are able to work together. So they cook together and they heat together. And that's really... And they make money. And they make money together. And that's really phenomenal. So these are some of our numbers. We have already benefited a thousand plus numbers of young people today. <coughs> our repeats in terms of outreach of children are 1,550. You know how these NGOs, they say, we have an outreach of 20,000 children. What we like are the repeats, because the repeats come two to three times a week. That's how we, we, we work with them, that's how they grow with us. So our numbers are humble because we really work for years with the constituents that, uh, that are so-called beneficiaries, I like to call them citizens. And we also benefit 145 women in income generation. So many women cannot work from outside the home. They work from the home. They come to the community center, they produce. We connect them with designers, with people, and they market what they produce. And our campaigns have had an outreach of 5,000 people. Tell them so, I'm to that. Yeah, so, so the campaigns, uh, I want to move to Ala because I feel that we've taken up a lot of time. The campaigns are a long story. If you log online on YouTube, there is a film called Safe Homes Campaign. You will understand. R- Rwa.jo. Yeah. But campaigns are launched based, yeah, based on the organizing methodology. And organizing, what we believe in is that leadership infrastructure has to be built for impact to take place. So to have an outreach of 5,000, you need to organize a minimum of 150 organizers structured in different leadership teams, and these recruit then, specific tell us what these campaigns are. So the first one was called the Six Minutes Campaign, and it was basically a joy of reading campaign. We, we found out that a lot of the kids were illiterate, were not motivated to read. We created a strategy session with the mothers. We connected them with educators, because we believe the mothers are the experts on context. The educators can bring in the expertise, but you know, usually, in, in, in different types of things, they believe that it's the expert who can solve the problem. No, it's the people of the pain who can solve the problem. In the Safe Homes campaign, there were women who were beating their kids, and they wanted to learn how to change that. So we organized 165 of them, and we touched around 500 people because of that. And they learned the tactic, and we developed learning modules, and it's just a very sort of agile and a very flexible But in organizing, power is not a pyramid. You know, you have to tip the pyramid the other way. You start with seven as a core team, 
and then you build your first leadership team, for example, into 30, and then the second leadership team into 50, and then the third leadership team into 100. And that's how you multiply your impact. Because in organizing, numbers equal power. Because numbers of people who organize for a shared objective create power. This is why I tell you in Ruwad, the concept of power is very relational. It's about mobilizing resources of people, and the more people you can touch, the more power you can create in a community. Okay? So, he is the heart and joy of Fadi Rando. So, so he has to talk about Ala. Just to this show you what happens to somebody who gets a power. So, Ala Sadar is one of our graduates. He's one of our earlier graduates. In Amman, in Germany. In Germany. So, He's a very curious fellow, uh, got noticed very early on because he's one of those kids that had his hand up all the time. So uh, uh, curious, hardworking, and always bugged me when I came to the community and said, I want to build a website like Amazon to sell books. And I never paid attention to him. You know, a young, a young guy, uh, maybe a bit like you, 20 years old, saying, very, very. I want to do this, how can you help me do this? And I always ignore them uh, in the sense that, okay, I will listen to you. When you are ready, uh, we talk about it. But then he became ready, he graduated, he took another scholarship too, and went to Greece and got his master's degree, and then came back and came to me one day and said, I want a thousand dollars to uh, build a website. So I had, we had become friends. Uh, I gave him a thousand dollars, he built a website. He comes back, he says, I want ten thousand dollars to register a company. Because the minimum amount of capital you needed in Jordan to register a company was that. So, and this is literally. So I said, okay, here's ten thousand dollars, go build, uh, go register your company. And then he built what he, he built. He built a company called Jamalo. It's a very famous company now in the region. He went out and raised $400,000 in his seed capital. He built an online book, Arabic, the, the largest online Arabic bookstore with 10 million titans in it. And he just closed a round of uh, $4 million uh, in, in growth capital for his business. And he employs 70 people. A good amount of them were people he studied with at at Rouen, his community. His first his first group that worked with him was his mother. She did customer service. His young brother, his young brother who was five years old, he did his social uh, his social uh, uh, social engagement on Twitter and uh, and Facebook. And you you uh, you uh, there's actually a small uh, uh, a small documentary on the family because the first five people that worked for him were his mother, his mother and, and his brothers who were under age, obviously. And then but Ala is a superstar. Yeah. He has an office in, in Jordan, and he is disrupting and revolutionizing the book distribution, selling, and, and, uh, uh, and publishing business in, in the Arab world. He just uh, invested in something that's called, that's, which is globally new, called print on demand, which allows writers to actually write books and not necessarily fall into the trap of having to, to publish so many books. Because if you're not a very famous writer, nobody's gonna write. Uh, uh, nobody's gonna buy your books. So you end up in the trap of saying, "I can't afford to actually be a writer." So print on demand says, if you write one book, if you sell one single book, it's okay because print on demand allows you to do that. So in his mind, he's revolutionizing even even the literature process of allowing and empowering writers to become writers because they don't fall into the trap of publishers saying. Give me ten thousand dollars, I'll print your book for you. So, we, why do we say that story? Because I mean, there are. I'm not saying everyone is Allah. So I'm saying Allah did graduate, and Allah feels the power because he 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 will tell you the story of of what Ruwad did did to him and how how he it, it got him where he is today. And this is Hanan. Hanan graduated with a degree of psychology. She interned in Ruwad and became our human resource officer. When she was a scholar, she launched a campaign called Yalla Shamir because Jabal and Yalla Shamir means you go like this. Roll up your roll sleeves. Up your sleeves. sleeves. Up your Jabal and Nadif is known to, the word Nadif means clean, but Jabal and Nadif is filled with garbage. So people were saying, people are not clean, people are not clean. Then suddenly she said, there are 75,000 people living in Jabal and Nadif. 
and they need 1,200 garbage bins. And there are only 62 garbage bins available. And so she launched this campaign with a group of young people, and they started basically creating the garbage bins in collaboration with Amal municipality and solving the problem. Of course, when you organize, you solve the problem. When the group disorganizes, you go back to that same type of reality. But we found her initiative extremely inspiring, and now she married, and she wants to be an entrepreneur, like Fadi. And she lives in New Zealand. And she lives in New Zealand <laughs> with her husband. This is this is Ihab Gamal. Ihab is born and raised in the third biggest slum area in Cairo, Azad Khairullah. Ihab studied law as an undergraduate degree and has a postgraduate diploma. He is an unusually energetic, insightful, and thoughtful and mindful young man. Amal and I met him several times, and Fadi met him several times. During the establishment of Ruwad, we had these project managers who used to step in and were unable to live in the community for long periods of time, either because of you know, the strikes that used to take place, the violence, or because simply they couldn't see themselves belonging. And so I went to Fadi and Amal and I said, the only person who can lead this project is Ihab. He's 25, let's just give him the project management of the center. He can do it. He understands the model, he knows the young people, he organized the first 18 young people who were part of the asset mapping, let him take it. He's our project manager now. Uh-huh. He runs a center that buzzes with kids. We have a minimum of 150 children a day in a very small building, Fadi and Amal Nodis building. And he is there. And we recruit on a yearly basis now in Egypt 75 young people for the scholarship. Hopefully this year we will graduate 50 and we will start the cycle of having on site 75 and graduating 50. I'm very proud of him. Mm-hmm. He's, he's actually the one who is pushing this, of course, in partnership with Aramix. Because in Egypt, our model is an Egyptian model and it's funded by Aramix Egypt for various reasons, but they are like the back office of our world. So the young people in Aramix come and volunteer with him and support him. I know this guy. Yes. You want to tell his story? No. <laughs> <laughs> so Khalid is a scholar with uh, Reward Lebanon and you know, he dropped out of school at grade 7 and after three years of interruption, he kept at it and went back to school. He applied to our scholarship and received it and he's adamant. He wants to be a businessman and build his own business. And of course, uh, during his free time, he sells juice and corn on a small car to earn extra money. He's a very, very unique and special person. Lots of them are, actually. And, uh, you know, Jabal Mehsan and Tibani at one point in Tripoli was, was called Bab uh, al which means the door of the gold, because it was a very vibrant uh, commercial center. And I went with Sarah, our director there, to homes of women who lost their children during the struggle, and the mothers would cry and say, at, at a moment in time, our area was called the door of the gold. It was the most prosperous area. And it was, it's a really very painful, uh, but very hopeful place, I would say. Okay. So, youth organizing is at the core of what we do. We couldn't do all of this without the youth. They are like you, they are our, our manpower our economic manpower. If someone asks us what is our KPI, we would say that we organize on a yearly basis on site in all our centers, 450 youth in Jordan, Palestine, Lebanon, and Egypt. In return, they give us four hours, the equivalent of 84,600 hours a year. That's a lot of time. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of energy. In one center alone, I would say that we organize on a weekly basis a minimum of 45 to 55 activities. And if you come and visit us in Amman, in Jabal al nadif or in Tripoli, in Lebanon, or in Egypt, or in Budrush, you will see small groups organized around different types of activities inside the center or outside the center. So I want to welcome you all and to excuse you all at any point in time, beginning now, to think that you can always give back. Connect with us. You're most welcome to come and volunteer with us. 
and uh, remember we, we get a lot of volunteers by yeah. the way from from the US and yeah. other universities yeah. that want to come and, and spend a couple of uh, a couple of weeks a couple of months with us in the summer yeah. you know Fadi is very unique and he managed to organize so many of us and I shifted my career path to be part of the world but I think every single one of you can be Fadi so you have to start at it now <laughs> And who knows, maybe you will be able to give to your part of the world as much as you know, we are trying to give to the youth of our part of the world. It's lovely talking to you. So let's get one more round of applause before we open it up for questions. <laughs> So now we want to open up the floor to questions. If you guys have a question, maybe you guys can uh, just uh, raise your hand and you can call on them. So. Okay. Actually, I'll ask any question you want. Yes. Um, I'm actually curious about um, like the funding that you have for right. the scholarships. Right. As you continue to grow more and expand to more locations, how do you plan on continuing so, to get more funding? So, yeah, that's my job mostly. Uh, to, to, raise, uh, to raise the money and uh, to provide the funding. So, so can you repeat the question? Funding. He's uh, asking about the funding. Yeah. As, as the web grows. So, uh, here's what we do. Uh, the initial funding for the Jordanian operation has a, a core of a, a group of people that have committed to fund it perpetually. So every year, they allocate a specific amount of money and they pay it on a yearly basis, no questions asked. They continue to give. This is, think of it as an endowment without the endowment. <laughs> so endowments are created so that you make money from, uh, you, you spend money on your uh, programs based on the profits that come out from that endowment and nobody touches the endowment. Our model is, you go invest your money the way you want. If you're an entrepreneur, give us that hundred thousand dollars a year and and this is what we need for our program so we have a, a core of five uh, five different individuals and organizations that will give us the funding the complete funding for Jordan and in other countries either RMX uh, makes it its own uh, corporate social responsibility program so they they channel the funding in there and uh, we basically uh, don't do fundraising <coughs> We have uh, the original funders, and we're comfortable with what they give. Some, once in a while, some people say we're interested to be part of it, and there's a lot of in-kind work. So when we fix schools, we go to people that are, uh, we, a friend of mine, for instance, has a, has a furniture factory. He gave us all the school furniture for free. Another friend of mine has a paint uh, uh, manufacturing company, so he gave us all the painting for the school for free. We, we, there's a lot of income, so it's not only uh, about capital, it's about giving us uh, uh, anything that you might have. A lot of uh, private sector people send, send their own volunteers. We did a program just last week, uh, which was our first program uh, of its kind in Jordan, uh, of mentorship. So we matched students with mentors from the private sector or from real life because these kids on the margins are scared to death after they graduate. Uh, from they think, um, they don't know how to actually think about applying for jobs. They're, they have no idea. They, they think it's uh, it's an area that is exclusive for the affluent. And they don't know what to expect of life. So a lot of the time that what we work, what we do with them is actually place them in internships so that they get to feel that life. And in that uh, program, we brought in private sector people to mentor them. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's quite uh, a powerful effect on them. So uh, as we grow, and we want to grow slowly, by the way. We're not an aggressive growth audience. We don't want to do the million people thing. But this is not our thing. Somebody else might be able to do it. We are very focused on what we do, and we are very happy with the people that are committing to us. And uh, we just grow incrementally. But 
We are getting attention now uh, from friends uh, and people who are noticing us. Uh, a friend of mine came uh, to talk to me. He wants to establish one in Basra in Iraq. Basra is the, is the oil region of Iraq today. It south. is in the south. It, is, it has less uh, political turmoil. It's relatively calm. And he said, I love what you do. I want to establish it in the south. So he sends his own people to get, uh, to get uh, to, to connect it with Samar, to understand exactly what the program is. And we basically said, you have to fund it. Here's what it is. But you have to commit perpetually if you want to carry our name. And we will give you all our knowledge. Everything that you want, we will give. We will set it up for you. We will train your people. And here's what you have to do, but you have to do it exactly as we are, if you want to carry our name. So no politics, no sectarianism, and uh, completely focused on youth empowerment. Another friend of mine who is from Libya came to me and, says, and said, I want, can you help us do this in Libya? And then we started to work with them in Libya, and then the crazy civil war happened there, but he just came back to us and said, maybe we should, now that the political situation is maybe a little bit better, Let's think again about doing something in Libya. A friend, another friend of ours who came and volunteered once in Ruwad from Bahrain came to Samar and said, I want to establish this in Bahrain. So there are, so the idea is you want to spread, we're, a, we're, an open, uh, we're an open source system. Our knowledge is available for anyone that wants to actually use it. And now we are finally in the final phase of documenting every single program that we know so that we have that Bible of saying, if you want to do Ruwad, here's how it's done. Go, go do it, and we will train you, and we will, and, and we will uh, uh, actually go and set it up with you. And help finance it as well, of course. And? Help finance it. Yeah, yeah, we always seed everything. So we, we as a family, will, uh, if you come and tell me you want to establish something somewhere, as long as you take the core of the program, I will be the first seeder of that investment. So we will see. It. So when, when our friend came to Tripoli uh, to do the one in Lebanon, we were the first people that said, we, are, we, will, uh, we will match you if you actually establish it. So we, we give them that first push to get the program. But we, don't, we will not own that initiative. You have to run with it.